very much, Brendan. Good evening, everybody. I hope this is going to work. Uh, coming season, are you prepared? But before that, as a usual uh, commercial about the, um, the beekeeping book that I've had out several years now, um, I'll warn you there's about three or four more in the pipeline, so there's, uh, there's some more to come. Um, what you may not know is that I currently own and manage Dave Cushman's website. Um, it's probably, or it's reckoned to be, the world's uh, most comprehensive beekeeping uh, website. And all the information on there is sound. So if you want something, um, have a look on there and, um, uh, and you'll find it. There's no fluffy stuff um, and there's no uh, myths, there's no legends or anything of that nature. I will be referring to that as I go through later. Um, I just mentioned to uh, Brendan that I've aimed this uh, mainly at the newer beekeepers. Um, this is a standard talk for me and I've tweaked it just a bit, uh, certainly for a mainly Irish audience and um, also um, towards perhaps the newer beekeepers because I saw that your other program was probably quite advanced for them and uh, uh, new beekeepers, in my view, need um, uh, need a lot of help at the moment. But uh, there should be something for everybody. And as with everything, even if you come up with um, uh, uh, something different, hear something different, please, please, please try to have an open mind. There's too many closed minds in, uh, in beekeeping. Um, but with that, of course, there needs to be a will to uh, change. So what do we actually mean by season? Well, do we mean the active season? <laughs> or is it just when supers go on until they come off? Is it from the first inspection until the last? Is it during the swarming season? Well, beekeeping is actually a cycle. There's no fixed times as um, uh, perhaps the books or the, um, uh, or the internet will, will, will tell you. It's, it's, a, it, it's a continuous cycle as far as the bees are concerned. But whatever we mean, um, they actually change because each year is different and you've only got to be in beekeeping five years and you'll get five different uh, um, uh, uh, seasons. Um, why is that? Well, it's probably partly climate and obviously timing because some springs uh, can be four weeks different from the last or the next one. And as gardeners uh, will know, once you get to uh, August, or when you get to August, um, uh, things have evened out quite a bit. Then, of course, there's a district uh, variation, because um, I suspect that um, uh, what happens in uh, Cork um, doesn't happen in Tipperary and doesn't happen in Connemara. It's, um, uh, it, although it's only a, a short distance apart, really, in relative terms, it's um it can be quite different so preparation then uh you need knowledge and experience you need to decide what you want <laughs> you need to decide what management techniques um you're going to use um you really need to be aware of the uh, queen problems um you presumably consulted some um uh, uh, resources, information uh, uh, sources, and in beekeeping, keeping, uh, planning is important. So let's look at all these a little bit closer then. So knowledge and experience. If you aren't very um, experienced, just have a chat with the uh, local beekeepers. Seek help and advice. Don't go charging off to the uh, internet because... Um, uh, it's so easy to find out what's happening in uh, uh, Texas or Florida or, or California. Um, it's not likely to suit, uh, suit you. So have a chat with your local beekeepers. Good, sound, solid, sensible beekeepers. Not the noisy ones that, um, uh, that will shout everything from the rooftops. You need to know the basics as, uh, uh, as well. Very important. And the basics to me are the life cycles. And it may surprise you that I regularly come across people who've been keeping bees 5, 10, 15, sometimes 20 years, do not know the life cycles of the, um, uh, of the Queen's uh, drones and uh, uh, workers. They really don't. 
Um, that, of course, has relevance to the swarming process. And it's surprising to people who haven't, the beekeepers who haven't got a clue what's happening inside a colony uh, when it's preparing to swarm. I still hear what I consider to be fairly experienced beekeepers think that, uh, that bees only swarm uh, when, when the weather's fine. Yes, they do, but not for that reason. You need to be able to recognize um, the diseases as well. Certainly the foul broods, um, they're, they're uh, uh, very important. Um, and talking about disease recognition, uh, again, I come across, regularly come across beekeepers who really ought to uh, know the bee diseases, uh, but they don't. Um, uh, within the last couple of years, I was doing a, um, a demonstration in a teaching apiary where there was the, uh, the, uh, uh, the apiary manager, um, the, uh, the chairman and the county education officer. And there were 14 people on the course and I had two other people with me uh, helping me. And I came across some parasitic mite syndrome. And there was only one person out of those uh, 14 uh, that knew what it was. The others hadn't got a clue. So, you know, that's a common thing, parasitic mite syndrome. And um, uh, they just didn't know. You also need to know the life cycle of Varroa because um, uh, the vast majority of us uh, have got it. And if you're treating for it or you're even not treating, uh, you still need to know what the, um, uh, what the life cycle of the Varroa is so that um, uh, you can understand what, um, uh, what the treatments are trying to achieve. And um, there's a list as long as your arm about that sort of thing, which I won't go into this evening. So decide what you want then. How many honey producing colonies do you want uh, during the summer? What do you actually want to do with your beekeeping? Um, there are getting, in my experience, more and more people with interests other than just producing honey. Uh, so if you're interested in perhaps in photography, uh, work out what you, um, what you want to take photographs of. Sometimes you might have to sort of manipulate the colony uh, just a bit in order to do so. Work out what perhaps you might have to do. Same with microscopy too. And um, a lot more people these days are making things with um, hive products, things like beeswax and making uh, cosmetics and all sorts of things like that. Um, well, then you need perhaps to look um, uh, to the rest of the summer to, um, uh, to be able to prepare yourself for these things. As much as anything, you need to know how many colonies you want to try and put into next winter. And that may not be the same as your honey producing uh, colonies. Perhaps you decide that you want to um, downsize a bit or, or perhaps uh, increase. Uh, both of them do need a uh, planning in, in advance. So management techniques, <coughs> um, are you going to um, uh, do seven day inspections, 14 day inspections, anything in between? You really need to try and think of these things uh, beforehand so that you can work out what you're going to do and perhaps uh, get some equipment or make some equipment if indeed you need it. Um, this is largely going to be governed by uh, swarming. So you, you need to work out what prevention and control methods you're going to use. If you are going to make increase, I've put BDI in there because I know in Ireland you haven't got bee diseases insurance, but certainly uh, people in um, England and Wales will have. And I, I know um, uh, I know there are people here from uh, uh, in England and Wales. Um, be improvement as well. Um, most of us tend to want to keep good bees, but we don't always do anything towards uh, improving them. Um, quite a lot of beekeepers, unfortunately, uh, when they replace their queens, they just go and buy them. Um, why not produce them uh, yourself? In fact, Joe Whittacombe gave you a talk two or three weeks ago, and... Um, uh, about the uh, National Bee Improvement uh, Program. And um, although I didn't hear it, I'm sure he told, suggested to you 
that you raise your own queens rather than buying them in um, because they're more likely to suit your conditions than, um, uh, than, the, than the imported ones. Um, are you going to work for honey? Are you going to uh, perhaps abandon honey and perhaps um, uh, raise bees and queens for uh, other beekeepers? You need to work these, these things out. Uh, queen problems, anybody who's kept bees for uh, any length of time uh, should be aware of these. I've been writing about them now for um, uh, certainly, well, best part of 20 years. I certainly discovered them around about the turn of the century. Um, and um, I don't wish to be particularly big headed, but I think I was probably the first person to actually discover them, certainly in England, Ireland, and, you know, um, uh, our part of the world. What are the problems? Well, young queens being superseded, uh, very often in their first years, sometimes even as, as early as before the, uh, their first brood is sealed. Young queens failing and queens simply disappearing. I haven't got time to speak about this tonight, but there's a lot of information. There's a whole page on Dave Cushman's website of what I've discovered and um, what I think um, uh, ne needs to be done. So resources. Uh, there's some good information on the National Bee Unit uh, website. Um, uh, you might have to get into the bee base uh, uh, side of it. But even if you're in Ireland, there's uh, quite a lot of information there. I will say that it's probably disease orientated because, of course, that's what the National Bee Unit is, is mainly concerned about. Um, there's quite a lot of leaflets and booklets coming about. I know Nibs have got um, uh, a series of booklets now. I suspect the Scottish National Honeybee Society uh, have, although they're a young, slightly younger organisation. Bibber have got some, and they're, um, they're, they're all, rather, we are working on them, um, uh, on some more. And if anyone's interested, um, for probably five years, the Bee Wolf Cooper book, uh, Honeybees of the British Isles, has been out of print. I can now tell you that within the last week, it's come back into print. So it is now available for those who, who want it. Um, there are several others uh, in the pipeline. So um, uh, keep your eyes uh, skinned there. Uh, on top of that, I guess the National Beekeeping Associations have got their own um, uh, information uh, sources as well. Then, of course, there's uh, events. Um, I wrote of well, this program is about eight years old, so um, I, I left events in. Of course, there aren't too many about at the moment, but um, there's a BBK Spring Convention and various other um, uh, conventions. And, of course, uh, one of the great ones, certainly for most of you folk, is Gormanston. And I'd certainly recommend that to anyone. Uh, apart from this last year, I think I've been 15 years on, on, on the trot. And um, it, it's well, well worth a week week out. Then, of course, Dave Cushman's website that I've already mentioned. But there are your own teachers as well. If they are um, good, and they, they do vary quite a bit, obviously. If they're good, um, they're tuned into your particular uh, area. And um, they will tell you when to do things, how to do it, and that sort of thing. They, they, they should do. But your own observations should tell you an awful lot as well, because if you look at the bees, um, they are probably the best teachers. So observe them, interpret what they're trying to tell you. And a colony of bees, when you've got it open, is telling you something all the time, even if, yeah, we're OK, we don't need any uh, uh, we don't need any help, thanks. But they're telling you all sorts of things. They need extra soup, so they might need, might need a bit of extra food uh, or, um, or some queen cells cutting out or whatever. They're telling you things all the time. So planning, in my view, is really important. Um, once you get to the bees, they might have uh, not done quite as you expected and they may well change your mind for you. Uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, as long as you worked out what you what you you hope to do, don't be frightened to try new things either, <coughs> um, and experiment. But if you do, I suggest very strongly 
that you only do it on half your colonies because uh, if you do it on either none or all of your colonies, how do you know if something's worked or not, or it's an improvement, or it's easier for you, or whatever? If you uh, if you're doing something new on half your colonies, you've then got the sort of control. And it's one of two things that I do that I've done for years and years and years that I suggest you think about. One is instead of putting foundation in the brew box, um, get good you get better uh, brew combs drawn out above a queen excluder. And what's become known as the Patterson unit, which I'll very briefly describe in a minute. I've got a feeling that um, not enough people um, make use of comb honey. Uh, certainly going back 50, 60, 80, 100 years, a lot of beekeepers produced comb honey. And um, uh, I just wish people would um, would um, uh, would produce that uh, a bit more these days. So using brood chambers as supers, I work on single brood. Uh, so that's very definitely not a, a double brood, although I have been accused of it being a double brood. Uh, just put the foundation in the uh, a, a brood box. And the benefits of that are that, sorry, um, foundation in a brood box used as a super. Um, bees draw out far, far better combs above a queen excluder than they do if you put foundation in, uh, in the brood box. And the reason for that is that for bees to build out comb, uh, they need income with which to produce the wax. Now that can either come from forage or, or a feeder. I just do not like feeding bees, certainly during the summer. Um, so uh, if there's no nectar coming in, you put foundation in the brood chamber, what do the bees do it? Uh, do with it. They climb all over it and it goes sort of greasy and uh, uh, loses the um, uh, loses the um, uh, embossing of the, uh, the the cells the, the cell walls. It goes a, a bit sort of flat. Um, so if you get another week's bad weather, uh, what happens is the bees start chewing holes in it. All of a sudden, out comes the sun, um, and the young bees are producing wax, uh, and they just make a mess of it. And uh, I've seen that time and time and time again. If you put if you um, put um, a foundation above the brood, uh, ab uh, sorry, above the queen excluder, what you'll find is there's nowhere near as many bees there to uh, climb all over it. So when the sun does come out, uh, they will they will build it fine. Now you've got combs of food if you need them. So if perhaps you've got a a new crow colony, it's a bit short of food, just take one of these combs out and you could give it to it straight away. You haven't got to um, uh, uh, go indoors, make up some syrup and then feed in the evening and, and mess around like that. You can just take a, a comb straight out and give it to a, a, a colony. Uh, you've also got work for comb builders, uh, so it might reduce your uh, swarming. The great thing is that they usually build them straight so you can uncap them nice and straight, and then you've got good brood combs, which are instantly available if you want them. So if you put them in a nuke or a colony, the queen can lay out quickly, and um, uh, she hasn't got to wait for the um, foundation to be, be drawn out, uh, so you get quicker build-up. And the great thing about it is the foundation doesn't go stale by travel, as it does in a um, if, if, if you put it in the brood nest. And... If you do this, uh, I'm sure you'll find there's far more flexibility with your uh, beekeeping. So try and get them on early if you can. Always a foundation, get, get, get it on early. You don't really want half a, half a comb built. Uh, leave it in your shed over, over winter because the bees um, aren't usually that keen on um, uh, finishing it off in, in, the, in the following year. We've got also rape. Um, I know there are some people, uh, certainly here from England, uh, who've, who've got also rape. I know it's a little bit grown in Ireland, but not at the rate it is in, um, uh, in certainly England and Wales. 
And the great thing about it is that um, once you've uncapped these, they will, they will store for some time, uh, two, three, four years, if you're careful. A wax moth won't usually get at them. Uh, the only problem you've really got is mice, but um, uh, if you have a stack of boxes, queen excluder top and bottom, that's quite over that problem. Now, if you've got larger combs, such as perhaps commercials, uh, 14 by 12 or Langstroth or something like that, and they don't fit your extractor, that's okay, doesn't really matter. Um, because you can use those combs for uh, winter feeding. And then of course, next year, they're already in the brood chamber. <coughs> so here they are, you get nice straight combs built. Uh, so you uncap those, and this is what you get after extraction. Now, if you put foundation in a brood chamber, sometimes this can happen. This is a comb it's, um, uh, that was put, um, that was next to a sheet of foundation uh, in a nectar flow. Now, brood cells are the same depth, length, call it what you like, whatever happens. But honey cells, um, well, put stores in, they can be extended, which is why, of course, we have wide spacing in addition to, uh, uh, to narrow spacing. So what happens is when you get uh, a nectar flow, the bees find it easier to extend existing cells than to build out um, uh, from foundation. So the next frame to this one, oh, sorry, that, um, you, you can see that step there. Um, so the next um, next frame to this was that one there. That was the adjacent comb. That area there, the bees built out because uh, on the uh, on the other comb you just seen, there was just brood in that area. But these areas here, they've left foundation because they found it easier just to um, uh, to build out existing comb in the other in the adjacent comb. Than to, than to build on, on, on this. And we all have these, and, that, and that's good to some of those uh, I've, um, uh, I've seen. Uh, that is certainly on this side, you've got a quarter of it, it's no good. <laughs> so <coughs> that is getting uh, brood combs drawn out. The other one is a Patterson unit, which I, uh, started to use, I suppose now, 15 years ago, as a result of the queen problems that I told you. There were so many queens going down in honey production colonies that what I found I had to do was to rob one of the other, if indeed rob's the right, right word, rob one of the other honey production colonies to put it right. So what I came up with was uh, this idea. This is actually our Whisper Green teaching apiary, or, or certainly the old one. We've moved it um, now. So uh, we, we've done this as a, um, uh, a, a, a teaching thing for all, year after year for a long time, uh, 10, 12 years, something like that. So what you do is you make up a unit. Four colonies works really well, but if you've only got two, two or two, if you've got six, you make up your own one, you have one unit of six or two or three. Now they're the honey producing colonies and to support those, you have what I call a support colony, which in this case is a small one, but it could be anything up to a full colony itself. <laughs> now, if one of the queens goes down and the honey producing uh, colonies, you've immediately got a queen in there that, uh, that you can uh, um, uh, uh, put in a place. <laughs> Here is a brood box. It's not a double brood. It's a brood box that's being um, used as a super to draw out brood combs. So the benefits of that, uh, and this, this, by the way, is a talk on its own. So um, in two slides, I can't tell you too much about it. Um, the benefits are is a very, very much more flexible management uh, system. It helps overcome the modern problems because, as I say, if I want a queen or if I want a frame of brood or a frame of food, that's where it comes from rather than one of the others. 
Now, support colonies can usually be uh, overwintered. So, um, what's the benefit of that? It makes up for your winter losses before they happen. And most people these days are getting um, around about 25% uh, winter losses. There you are. There's your, there's your winter loss before it happens, rather than putting it right in the spring. If you want to make increase, um, you can make increase from the uh, from the support colony. But the great benefit I found was it keeps all the honey producing colonies fully productive, whereas previously they weren't. <laughs> if you want to replace uh, old combs, uh, you can do that uh, easily because all you do is just make up the um, uh, the support colony with um, with the older combs at your other colonies. You've got a spare queen if you want it. And you've also got the opportunity to cull poor bees. So if one of those four colonies is, uh, you know, a bit bad tempered or whatever, um, then just replace it with the one in the um, uh, support colony and then raise another one in your support colony. <coughs> A comb honey, personally, I think it's the best way to eat it. It's, 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 it's almost to me like drinking cow's uh, milk straight from a cow. Nearly got that wrong way around, didn't I? Um, the great thing is you don't actually need any extracting equipment. And extracting equipment is actually quite expensive. So most people only use it a couple of days a year. Um, so it, it, it avoids that. You've got no storage uh, problems, uh, no bottling, no straining or anything of that nature. What I suggest you do, though, is uh, freeze it. Uh, that's to kill off any wax moths, um, grubs that you've got in there or, um, uh, or eggs. Don't let it granulate. Uh, I don't particularly like uh, granulated comb honey. I know some people actually do. If you do, then that's fine. Um, uh, I know one beekeeper whose son likes uh, uh, granulated ivy honey, but um, uh, I'd eat it, but I, uh, if there was something else, I'd probably take that. And the great thing is it's unlikely to ferment, where, of course, with um, if you uh, don't extract very well, you, you know, you, you extract unripe honey, um, that is likely to ferment. So you could go in for sections, which um, in Ireland, I think there are a lot more produced than there are in uh, in England. If anyone, uh, any older beekeepers are here, um, you look fairly closely, you'll find that they were actually Bernie Myers, rather late Bernie Myers. Um, if you wanted to go for the round uh, sections, you can. Um, but of course, both of those, um, you'll need either a section rack or... Um, uh, all the full, um, uh, I think Cabana are the only ones that do round sections these days. The boxes are actually quite expensive. I believe a, a super of the round ones, uh, sorry, Ross rounds rather than Cabana. Ross rounds, I think they're probably about £60 now. Then, of course, you can use to cut comb, which is just producing comb honey in uh, a frame, preferably on wired. Um, and uh, you just cut the honey out, out of the uh, out of the comb. So that's that. Apiary, uh, the apiary and equipment. Well, of course, there's usually work to do. Uh, cut trees, cut hedges, dig out ditches, all sorts of things like that. It's a lot easier than... Um, than doing it in the summer because of course you shouldn't have any too much vegetation no leaves or anything like that <coughs> excuse me um, cut back further than you want to because of course you get brambles and that sort of thing come out and uh, and they, they can rip, rip your veils make sure your stands are good that they're solid uh, they're not rotting and they're of comfortable height so if last year um, your back ache, uh, then raise them a few inches and um, uh, uh, you shouldn't have the problem uh, this year. Think about what didn't go too well last year, what annoyed you, um, uh, the sort of things you can do to, uh, to make your beekeeping better. Don't um, uh, 
don't just automatically say, oh yeah, I'll try this, try that. Think about it. Of course, you've got um, eight months or so, uh, seven or eight months to clean, mend, replace, and a repair kit. Um, and there are so many beekeepers, of course, who uh, um, pack up at the end of the year after the honey's extracted, uh, and then almost forget their bees until uh, they're pouring at the front uh, next year. Um, you can do this sort of work leisurely. You can do it at your own pace, really. If you do need anything else or the replacements or to uh, make uh, life a bit easier or perhaps for expansion, uh, order what you need um, plus a little bit more. So quite frankly, things like frames, I would order in a, in a pack of 50 rather than in, in packs of uh, 10. Um, they're fairly reasonably priced and um, uh, they'll... Um, uh, the last few years anyway and they certainly won't go um they certainly won't rot if you're up in the up in the um up in your shed um if you get foundation early store it carefully uh don't just chuck it down under something else keep it nice and flat <coughs> preferably with something flat on top of it perhaps like a piece of plywood or um, a biggish piece of wood um otherwise if you're not careful it um it'll it, it'll bend and once that starts happening it's very difficult to uh, put it right get supers ready um and that i think there's a bit of art art in that i'll talk a little bit about that um uh, later um but don't do it too early because what you very often find is that the spiders will go in and they'll, uh, they'll create their own webs and you let's say in december um get all your supers cleaned up put them in a stack uh, you don't look at them you put them straight on the bees and the poor old bees get caught up in the spiders webs uh, at least if you just look at them uh before you put them on uh, you can tease out the uh, the webs um <clears throat> record sheets and cards you've probably all got some um, but just have a look at them, see if they can be uh, improved, see if they can make them easier for you to um, uh, operate uh, and read and decipher what's on there. And the only point of putting uh, record sheets on there, um, uh, things on record sheets, is so that you can it, it can help you um, with, with your management. So you sort of understand what's been happening in the colony. You've got a little bit of a history. And sometimes you can have a look at the end of the year and you think, cool, I forgot that happened with that colony. Hmm, yeah, I better watch out for that. Um, repairing equipment. <clears throat> this, uh, I was invited one evening to uh, give a demonstration at um, uh, another beekeeping association. And there were about four or five demonstrators, plus me. <coughs> and I looked uh, around when I finished mine and um, there was this group taping up um, the hive behind me. So I, of course, being a bit nosy, I inquired what they were doing. And they were plugging up various holes uh, to stop the bees, um, uh, uh, the bees coming in and out at will. Um, and they were doing it with parcel tape like this. And I thought to myself, cool, I've got to undo that and do it all up. Um, uh, every time they inspect a hive, uh, why not just mend your boxes? Now, I think you can look at those boxes and say, well, they're still pretty uh, sound and solid, uh, but a little bit of work on them would have saved all that hassle, um, plus, of course, putting all that tape into a landfill site somewhere. So this is the sort of thing I do. That's the corner of a box. Um, if, it's, um, if it's broken away, just replace it. It doesn't take very, uh, very long, uh, and you're almost back to new again. <clears throat> now, I mentioned um, uh, supers. <laughs> How often do beekeepers come across super combs that have got uh, pollen in like that? And they don't know why. Uh, and I'm serious, they don't know why. So uh, I'm going to tell you on the assumption that some of you might not know as well. 
Bees normally only put pollen in worker uh, uh, cells. <coughs> so if you only use worker in your uh, supers, then you're going to get quite a lot of pollen. Uh, what's wrong with pollen? Well, uh, the bees have collected all that lot. Um, you're going to uh, extract it. You're going to uncut, un, um, uncap the comb. Uh, put it in the extractor. It's probably going to throw the extractor out of balance. You're going to swear about it. Um, and what you're going to do, you're going to put it in the back of the shed uh, in a pile. Uh, so that next year, it's uh, all um, it's all gone mouldy. So no use to the bees, no use to you uh, at all. Uh, if you think about it, uh, you can get over that. How can you get over it? Well, oh, sorry. There's, the, um, there's that very frame. Uh, with look, look at all that, it must be over 50% uh, pollen there. Well, in fact, bee bread rather than pollen, but let, let's not worry about that. So you can get over it because bees in general um, don't put pollen in drone comb. So use drone comb. And this is the one immediately above the, um, uh, the queen excluder. And the same area that if it was worker comb, they will put pollen in. Uh, they leave it. I don't know, but I assume because it's effectively on the periphery of the nest uh, where drone comb normally is in a natural nest. The queen th thinks, oh, well, um, I'll, I'll go up, or the bees think, uh, the queen will go up and lay uh, uh, drone eggs in there. Of course, they can't. Uh, so uh, if you put a super like that underneath, a, uh, underneath the existing supers, uh, the next one you put under again, uh, the bees will then fill uh, fill that gap up. So that gets over that problem. Uh, if you've got a mixture, uh, just put the drone comb in the middle of the boxes, probably the middle of five frames, something like that, uh, on wide spacing, that is. And the outside ones put as some um, uh, worker, and you shouldn't get very much pollen in your supers. So just little things like that, which um, uh, us older folk really ought to be handing down to the newer beekeepers. So the bees themselves, <clears throat> um, even from now on, ensure that they've got enough food. Um, quite honestly, if you fed them uh, properly, um, they should last right through to the spring. But if you've got some of these um, um, exotics, um, the um, uh, prolific exotics, um, there's even the National Bee Unit have, um, oh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, perhaps, have put a, a, a warning out to people in England and Wales, feed your bees, feed your bees. Those of us who've got, let's say, decent bees, um, don't know what it's all about. Um, but some of the more prolific ones, of course, the queens just lay and lay and lay. The bees just turn it, um, uh, turn what food they got in into brood, and that's why they run short of food, of course. Uh, so only only feed if they need it. Uh, I know people very often um, uh, give fondant whether they need it or not. Um, personally, I don't think it does uh, any any good at all but only only feed if they need it and then of course you can be getting into early inspections um depending on where you are uh any time from sort of early march uh, onwards uh there's no need to give full inspections just to have a look make sure they've got enough uh, food whip the crown board off uh and if you can see sealed food on three, four, five frames looking at you, you're generally okay for another two or three weeks. Have a look to see if the queen's laying. Um, and that's not always the case because, of course, you do get queens uh, failing during the, um, uh, during the winter. And certainly the early inspections, uh, I would look for foul brood as well. Um, but I do... Uh, anyway, every inspection I'm checking for foul brood. Then get pre preparation for spring cleaning. Uh, I do it as early as possible, but you need to do it when uh, when it's sort of fairly warm weather and the bees are flying well. So you need to prepare a, uh, a complete um, uh, hive. 
make sure it's clean, you scraped it out or whatever. Um, and some spares as well, because you're probably going to have some that need, um, uh, need a bit of repair or re replacement. Now, when I say clean the hive, uh, I've never ever flamed anything out. Um, uh, or not for myself anyway. I have for other people because that's what they want. Um, all I do is just scrape it out with a um, with a hive tool, and uh, that's all I do. And then um, uh, that that's good enough. <clears throat> Take the roof off and check it, and you can actually learn quite a bit by that. <clears throat> um, you don't necessarily have to do it at spring cleaning. You could do that beforehand. Certainly during the winter um after uh rain uh obviously when it's dry just take your roofs off have a look inside have a look especially in the corners to see if there's any damp if there is what's probably happened is that um the uh, corners where the metal's folded there's a hole um uh, appeared well you can fill that up either with um uh, this sort of uh, uh, sealant that they put in bars or what I find is easier is propolis. Just warm that in your hand, um, get it nice and pliable and just push that into the crack and that, that, that gets um, that um, uh, problem out of the way. Now you can also tell quite a bit from the inside of a roof <clears throat> because you've got to get it in your mind uh, that wood lice like it uh, damp conditions and spiders like dry conditions. So if you've got wood lice, you've got a damp roof. So something's causing a problem. Uh, check it and um, uh, uh, block off the hole. If you've got spiders, um, then uh, it should be dry. But some roofs, I'll warn you, you can get both spiders and, uh, and wood lice in. So um, that ought to tell you something. Um, so what I do is I uh, simply move the hive to one side, off the stand, replace with a, a, a clean a floor and, and brew box, take the crown board off the uh, hive that I've just moved, clean off the tops of frames with the, um, uh, with the hive tool, uh, save the wax, don't forget, because you might need that for your uh, whatever you're doing later or, you know, put it in for... Um, foundation exchange or whatever. Uh, and then transfer the combs uh, one by one into the clean box. Have a look at every one. And I mean, have a look at every one. If you've got poor combs and just mark them in some way, either with, um, with a drawing pin or your uh, queen marking pin, uh, just put a little dot or a couple of dots or whatever. Uh, have a look at the um, uh, brood, make sure that's okay. Absolutely no foul brood or anything. So just transfer them across uh, as you go. If you see the queen, she's not clipped and marked. You can clip a marker if you indeed want to. Uh, and then once you've done that, uh, close it down. And we're only talking about a quarter of an hour per colony, that's all. Um, clean your kit. Uh, and if it's, uh, if it's sound, uh, that does the next colony. If not, uh, if it needs a repair and these extra nails or, or whatever, then either go and repair it or um, or put it to one side and do it when you're finished. <clears throat> a lot of beekeepers put their supers on late, and this is what can happen. So, sorry about my attempt at graphics on um, on PowerPoint, um, but I hope you get the idea of what, what I mean. There, right in the middle, is say, uh, the, the brood nest, which in the spring should be expanding. If it's got enough food, it should be expanding. So it expands, expands, expands. And then sometimes in the spring, you've got three, four days or perhaps a week, really good weather. <clears throat> There's a lot of nectar and pollen in, in the spring, trees and dandelions, and all sorts of things like that. Uh, and most of the things in the spring produce both nectar and pollen. So that's why I think you get um, uh, quite a bit more than, uh, than, uh, uh, than normal. So what do they do with it? <clears throat> if you cramp them down, 
the bees uh, put it round the brood and the queen neck then gets crowded out and they push it out further and further and further. Once you've got something in the cell, it's very difficult to get bees to shift it uh, on, on, on their own. You've got to do some sort of manipulation to, to try and do it. Nectar, I find, isn't too bad. Uh, but certainly once they sealed it, turned it into honey and seal it, it's quite difficult sometimes to get, get bees to move it. So, of course, that gives you an ongoing problem. <coughs> uh, so, of course, what happens is bees uh, seem to think, if indeed bees think, that they've got enough uh, uh, space, up go the queen cells, and then, of course, you've got a, a, a swarming problem. But if you put a super on, even if it's early, that's where the bees put the, uh, uh, the nectar because they always put it above the brood if they've got um, an, uh, an option. So that then means that uh, down in the brood chamber, the queen can um, lay uh, more brood when, when necessary. So I'm sorry about the graphics, but that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's basically how it goes. Now, when to do it? Well, it depends on your district, um, what you do and uh, uh, when. And it does vary quite a bit because taking England, uh, I've been in the same, or two consecutive weekends rather, sometimes I've been down in Cornwall, uh, one and up in Northumberland, uh, the next, or the other way around. And really it can be six weeks apart, it really can. Uh, so it's no good uh, listening to people and say, oh, the second week in March, you should be doing this. It might be in your area, but if somebody from, um, uh, it don't have to be that far away. It could just be height that's the issue. Um, you know, somebody in a hilly district is, is going to be different than um, uh, in an arable uh, area. <clears throat> Get your foundation on at the right time. Um, and I always say to um, my people at Whisper Green, uh, if you know you're going to put foundation on uh, this year, be probably because you haven't got enough uh, comb, get it on early. Don't put it on late because the bees will either uh, leave it or they'll partly draw it out um, and then come next year um, and they don't really want to know, uh, know about it. So try and get your foundation on early. Beginners very often get told, oh, you've got to get some um, uh, a super comb drawn out quickly. Personally, I think that's poor, um, uh, poor advice because very often they're also told to get a second colony as quick as they can. Now, if they used a brood box as their first super, uh, they've got something to extract if they want to. And they've also got some uh, decent um, uh, decent comb uh, for their second colony. So if you are just starting, I suggest very strongly that you, um, uh, when you're super, make the first one a brood box rather than uh, rather than a super. And of course, give them plenty of space in advance. Now that is early in the season. <clears throat> so of course you need, when I'm in space, I'm in super space. Uh, so of course that means you need to get your supers organized uh, early. Don't leave it till the last minute because you'll be rushing off into the shed to, uh, uh, to, get, to get a super that, um, uh, that your colony wants. So what happens is you rummage around and out jump half a dozen mice and you know, you know the next. Well, if you don't, you'll probably find out. Um, <clears throat> smoker fuel. Um, this is something that concerns me with, with beekeepers a bit. I don't know how many um, beekeepers uh, I come across that ask me what smoker uh, fuel I use. I go to other people and they've got things like uh, uh, egg boxes. And I went to one, one chap and he just uh, had little bits of dried moss. I've got 
Um, fairly well known, I've got two dogs. Uh, this stuff is touch wood, um, which is very, very light. You can just break it up. Every time um, you go through woods, you come across this sort of thing. Um, so I've got two or three dog food bags, um, and I mean the 15 kilo ones, filled up with this sort of stuff. Uh, and if I run a bit short, I've got an old rucksack, take dogs out for a walk, uh, pick up a rucksack full of, uh, of this stuff, and it, I find it really good for um, a, a smoker fuel. And it burns just like that um, with absolutely no, uh, no problem at all. Nice and easy to use. But then I see people buy, buy, actually buying smoker fuel. Cool. You shouldn't have to do that. <clears throat> if you're on the sworn um, collector's list, um, you need to uh, prepare... Uh, get all your kit up together beforehand. Don't ru rush around uh, when you get the, uh, the um, uh, call. I've got a swarm in my in my tree. Get everything ready. <clears throat> so you'll need a scap or perhaps a box. Um, and if you have got neither of those, it's about the only good use I've, I've found for a poly nuke box um, because I've, I've, I find it find they really are quite good because they're light and they're decent size. Uh, and they're easy enough to grab uh, grab hold of. Um, to cover them up, you'll need uh, something like a cloth or a blanket or perhaps a hessian sack. Um, if you have any building work done uh, locally, certainly in frosty weathers, um, brick layers uh, use hessian. Um, see if you can grab some of that because that, that's, that's really useful. It's tough, um, it breathes, uh, whereas perhaps a blanket might not. Um, and all you're doing really is laying that down on the ground so that you can uh, get your swarm into your container, whether it's a scape or a box or whatever it is, turn it upside down onto the, um, uh, onto the cloth, and then you can wrap the cloth up and you shouldn't lose very many bees. <clears throat> queen cages always, or queen cages, should I say, uh, always useful. Uh, if you've got something with a hole in, like, like, or you know, um, something you can poke wire through, like a skep, um, then I've got um, a piece of uh, wire looped onto the uh, queen cage so that I can push it through the skep, turn it over the other side, and um, uh, if I get the queen, uh, I, know of, uh, I, I know I can't lose the swarm. <clears throat> I've always got clipping and marking kit. But very often you see the queen uh, clipper and marker because she's not going back at the top of that uh, that tree that you've um, that you've just taken her out if you if you clip her. Hive tool and smoker are always useful. Sometimes you've got to smoke bees out of um, places, out of hedges and um, uh, drain pipes and all sorts of places like that. And of course, a hive tool is always a useful piece of kit uh, anyway. It's surprising what you can use that for, even if it's not uh, uh, beekeeping. String's useful. And when I say string, I mean baler twine type thing. You know, something that doesn't stretch, doesn't break, um, so that you can tie your cloth up with, with your box. Old comb's always useful because sometimes you can get a swarm. It's, a, it's perhaps in a hedge or something like that. Difficult to get out. Holly hedge or a, um, a quick thorn hedge. If you put an old comb above it, um, very often you can entice the uh, bees on, onto the old comb. And then, of course, you can shake, uh, keep shaking them off into your, into your box. And once you get a swarm running, it generally keeps going. Sawn secateurs are, are, are pretty useful bits of kit, uh, as is a good sharp pocket knife. But, of course, if you are going to um, uh, somebody's garden, um, and you need to saw a branch off. Uh, make sure it isn't an ornamental tree that they've uh, um, that they've uh, very delicately pruned. <coughs> I mentioned records earlier, and um, I think it would be handy if everybody occasionally looked at their records um, to see if they can't improve them. Um, this is basically what mine is. It's a sheet of A4 with 19 uh, records on. So it's just the whole hive for the year. 
in the left hand side is the date so let's say 5th of march um, yeah 5th of may or june or whatever next to next i've got three lines with either y or n and i'll cross out the one i don't want is the queen laying yes or no <clears throat> if she isn't laying obviously uh, no if there's young uh, larva but no uh, eggs and clearly she's not laying is she clipped a mark? Well, if I don't see her, I don't put anything. But that's either a yes or no. So I do know the last time that I actually saw her. And I'll say that I probably see my queens without looking for them every other time I inspect the colony. And are there any queen cells? Uh, yes or no. <clears throat> and when I say queen cells, I mean eggs or um, uh, or, or, or larva, or even still ones. In. They're sort of active. Now, as an experienced beekeeper, I don't need to know any more than that. Um, all sorts of things that people put in, if they want to, that's absolutely fine. But I don't, I, I, I don't need to. I can tell if the colony is expanding or staying where it is. Um, you know, so I don't need any more. And then two columns which are really important to me. One is the temper of the colony, and the other is the calmness. Now, I've got some notes down here. This is this sheet is printable off our, our Whisper Green uh, website. Uh, you can this it's out. It's only in Word, and you can play around with it as much as you like. It's not protected, so if you want to take it, please feel free to do so. Uh, add your own columns, change them. Do exactly uh, what you like. Um, going back to the yeses or nos, I've um, I've put in red what I'd normally cross out. Let's say now temper and calmness. Um, they're my own figures. I I give um, uh, give marks out of ten, but nobody else would be able to um, uh, to interpret those. Um, if you want to go down that route, have a look at the Gauti bee breeders because uh, I don't know if they still got it, but certainly at one stage they they they've got five marks and they tell you what five is, they tell you what four is, they tell you what three is. So, to a degree, two different beekeepers could probably assess a colony um, uh, very very closely, and then of course there's a comments uh, column. That's all that that I do. If you want to do more, that's absolutely fine. Um, but some of those that I see, um, you probably need an honours degree in hieroglyphics to be able to work them out. And uh, um, beekeeping should be an enjoyment to me, not a chore. What do I do with it? <clears throat> well, clipboard uh, and a little plastic document wallet inside the roof of the hive. That's where it stays. Uh, the roofs are um obviously dry um it stays there all, 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 all the summer so it's there and i can see what to what, what i've got ah nailing frames yes um you can certainly nail frames and pack them in for soups or brew chambers until you need them don't put any foundation in until uh a day or so before you actually need it now i'm going to tell you a little trick here um because um, this is the bottom corner of the um, uh, of the frame. You can see the uh, the bottom bars there. Everyone tells you to nail in from the bottom there, um, and the reason I tell you is so that you can take the frame to bits to clean it. So what happens with that? Well, once you've got a hole, um, a nail in a hole, uh, the next time it comes out uh, much easier. Uh, and then you speak to people and they say, uh, oh, well, I don't, um, I don't clean them anyway. They're cheap enough. I'll chuck them away. So what's the point? So I nail down through that way because it prevents the bottom bars coming out. So here we are like that. That's the way I do it. And this is the reason why. <clears throat> because they're on the top of top bars of the frame underneath and one of the bottom bars. So what's happened, of course, is that the bees have 
built up. Uh, the soup has been taken off the uh, top and the bottom bar has been left behind. Um, so uh, that's why I, I, I don't do it. I suggest quite strongly that to prevent that happening, if you have nailed underneath like other people have told you, <coughs> Uh, just go round again and just put another nail in and then you shouldn't have this this happen to you. I can tell you if you if these come out they're very very difficult to get back in again don't put foundation in your frames um, uh, straight away because this is what's hap what, what's happened especially if you don't um, don't put them upright if you just lay them down as this one's been, has been, uh, you can see that they've um, uh, the, the, they've bowed. So when you do put foundation in in, in frames uh, a few days beforehand, make sure they're upright in the box. So colon inspections before you inspect a colony make sure you've got a purpose you know what you're going there to see and perhaps have a have a plan um, as i think i've already mentioned the bees may well change your mind for you because very often in an apiary you get two colonies that appear to be exactly the same you do exactly the same things uh, to them uh, and the next time you come they both behave differently uh, so uh, you must uh, you must expect that you you got to change you, you change your mind. Now, what you like for seeing eggs and larva? If the corneal mouth is just beginning to turn up and you've got a problem, don't just suffer the problem. Do something about it. You can get either magnifying glasses quite cheaply. Um, you can also get Fresnel lenses too, which are quite quite useful uh, bits of kit and uh, they don't cost very much but they are a great help don't wait till the season get it done now so next time you go to a market store or whatever uh, have a look out and you, you'll um, uh, uh, you, you'll save yourself a lot of hassle during the summer um, before you go to colony um, just have a look at record if they're inside the hive roof that's absolutely fine just have a look, make sure the usual sort of things. Queen was laying last time, there's no um, no queen cells, all that sort of thing. <clears throat> uh, take all the kit you need as well. Uh, most people have got some sort of box, but they very often leave something behind. Uh, and what I haven't got down here is a, is a bottle of water because um, sometimes on a hot day, um, you can need it, not the bees. <clears throat> observation 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 just have a look at your colonies just get into the habit uh think about it start thinking about it now get in the habit before you go to a colony just look at the entrance for a start and then once you've opened the colony look at the bees see what they're doing don't just go because a lot of people do um because um you won't learn anything at all um Colony inspection isn't a queen finding exercise. So there are loads of other things to do rather than just look for the queen. And there's a lot more than Hoopers 5 too. And I'm coming across more and more beekeeping associations that have just got Hoopers 5 or 6, whichever way you want to look at it, <clears throat> uh, on a sheet. And it's basically a tick box. Um, there's a lot, awful lot more to see, in, see in, in, inside a colony. And I'm a great believer in assessing colonies too, because I cull those that aren't up to scratch and I want to know what I'm going to raise queens from, which colonies to raise queens from. Get into the habit, if you possibly can, of checking every colony every time you go um, uh, to it for healthy broods, specifically the two foul broods. And what I teach people is that as soon as you come across a comb like this with brood in all stages that's absolutely ideal for uh, checking uh, foul brood because you can check the sealed brood for signs of uh, AFB and the unsealed brood for signs of EFB 
and if you just shake the bees off like that one, <coughs> excuse me, shake the bees off like that one, um, if you don't see anything, uh, then I wouldn't bother about the rest of the uh, uh, rest of the colony. But you're checking every time, and I can tell you, certainly EFB can come in very, very quickly because I think it was 2009, 2009, 2010, uh, I found um, EFB in the BBKO teaching apiary a week after the bee inspector had passed it. So it can come in very, very quickly. Okay, there are only half a dozen cells, um, but it doesn't matter. I caught it nice and early, simply because I'm looking for it all the time. At every inspection. <clears throat> Get a bait hive ready. Of course, it won't be for your, uh, for catching your swarms. It could well be ca for catching uh, uh, somebody else's. I'm a great believer in uh, collecting swarms because um, I really don't like, or certainly not at my age, don't like taking bees out of chimneys anymore. Uh, so the more beekeepers can uh, collect, uh, the better. So what do you need? <clears throat> you need a brood box. Needn't be your best one. Uh, anything that's a bit on the rough side to do, uh, even an old WBC uh, brood chamber is fine for being outside in, in the summer. No problem at all. Don't clean it. There's no need to. Um, it'll probably be more attractive to the bees if it wasn't cleaned. I would say one old comb, certainly if it's going to be at home, because you can check it every day. If it's in an out apiary, then yes, I'd fill it up because uh, swarms uh, are brilliant at building comb. And um, if the swarm goes in one day, uh, a couple of three days time, it's a big swarm uh, of boxes full up with, um, uh, 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 with comb. I don't like putting uh, more than one in at home because greater wax moth, um, certainly if it's warm, um, can uh, can make a mess of it in a couple of weeks. Um, so any old comb will do. Doesn't have to be anything uh, special um, because if you catch it early enough, uh, shake the bees off it, and if it's an old comb, you can. Um, uh, you can burn it just in case a, a very slight chance of uh, an incoming swarm being infected with fell brood. Um, solid floor. Bees don't like open mesh or swarms don't like open mesh floors. Make sure the entrance is small so the bees seem to think they can defend it. Uh, how big? Mm, about perhaps the size of the end of a matchbox. Oh, sorry, the side of a matchbox uh, should be absolutely fine. If you've got a crown board, even if there's old comb on like that, that's fine. That will probably attract a swarm better than a, a, a brand new one. And um, that's it, really. Uh, those of you who've heard my talks on energy lines, I always put them on energy lines, but I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to get involved in that uh, that this evening. Swarming, you really do need to know the process. I think I mentioned earlier that I've come across many people been keeping bees several years and they still don't know what's happening inside of the colony. You must learn it before you can try uh, controlling it. Otherwise, you haven't got a clue what the method is trying to uh, achieve. <clears throat> just a little bit of um, uh, light, um, uh, light information. I was once invited to go to a beekeeping association and they didn't have a teaching apiary and one of the members opened up their apiary. Anyway, uh, I got there and of course I was expecting to open uh, hives up and so were some of the other people. Anyway, um, the uh, the beekeeper said, uh, oh, I, I, I don't open my hives and no need to. Oh, why, is, why not? Oh, I put them on um, uh, uh, double brood chambers and uh, uh, on double brood chambers, they don't swarm. So there were a few people uh, grinning. So uh, there were about 20 or 30 people there. And um, uh, somebody said, well, why have we invited a, a, a demonstrator? And uh, 
the person said, oh, well, perhaps they can give us a bit of a talk then. So the, they got persuaded that um, perhaps we should open some of the hives. One of them I came to, which may well have been the first, I took, um, uh, opened them up, and this was what um, uh, what was um, uh, what was looking at me. Split the two boxes, and that was the other end. Uh, and that swarm had probably gone a week earlier. Um, so please don't think that by putting bees on uh, double brood chambers, you're going to stop swarming. Probably all you'll do is just get a bigger swarm out of it. So you need to know what happens when bees swarm. And um, with apologies to the more experienced uh, uh, knowledgeable beekeepers, I'm actually going to um, go through it because of the, um, uh, the newer beekeepers. So let's say day zero, which is today. The first egg gets, gets laid in the queen cell, and then there are others laid over several days, and they're staggered. The least I've seen them staggered is two days, which is quite rare. Usually it's between uh, five, six, seven days, something like that, staggered. After the third day, the first one hatches into a larva. And after eight or nine days, the first one to have egg in, we think, um, is um, uh, will be sealed. Now, some books tell you nine days. I'm telling you to uh, work on eight because we are dealing with biology and um, they don't always do what they're supposed to do. At that point, most of the time, um, expect the bees to swarm, providing the weather's uh, good. So what happens? The swarm's gone <clears throat> together with the old queen. Um, and then after 15, 16 days, the first virgin queen emerges. And one or two things happens. Either she will go off and head the colony um, and or run around and kill her sisters and head the colony, or perhaps uh, go off and head a second swarm, which is called a cast. So swarm prevention and control, we need to somehow um, deal with it um, with that knowledge. Now it's part of my overall management system. Not something I think of as soon as I see queen cells in front of me. I'm thinking of it all the time. What about you folk? Have you decided what swarm control or uh, prevention message you're going to use? Try it. So for <coughs> the newer beekeepers, this is the difference between having unclipped and clipped queens. With in unclipped queens, you really do need, if you possibly can, seven day inspection, and here's why. So if the queen uh, laid eggs in the queen cells soon after uh, last inspection, let's say at the same time, what will happen is after eight or nine days, um, if everything goes uh, to plan, uh, the bees will swarm. Now, if we go in the day before, after seven days, we inspect and we take action, whatever that is, so your swarm control method, the rest shouldn't happen. That's the theory of that one. Now with a clip queen, you can go 14 days. Some people say nine, but um, I, I go 14 days. And here's what happens if with a, a, a clip queen. So again, if the queen lays eggs and queen cells soon after your last inspection, um, the bees will swarm, but usually return. Either they'll probably go underneath or um, uh, the queen will come back, the, the swarm will come back, uh, or, or whatever. Might perhaps uh, get lost out, out in front of the hive, but usually the bees will swarm. Okay, occasionally they'll crawl along the ground and cluster somewhere or perhaps go in, in another hive, but they shouldn't... Um, uh, that they shouldn't uh, be lost. Uh, inside the hive, exactly the same as um, uh, as if the whole lot's gone. Um, the first virgin queen emerges, and usually the bees swarm with her, and perhaps uh, several other um, queens that emerged as well. And then there may well be another cast after that. But in my experience, unlikely because 
um, there isn't the length of time left to um, uh, to get um, uh, to build the numbers up. So, if you go in after fourteen days, even though the colony has swarmed, you may have lost the queen, but you you probably haven't lost the bees. The rest doesn't happen. So that's the theory of um, uh, clip non clip queens. And this is what you end up with, <clears throat> or one of the things you can end up with, a little knot of bees about the size of a golf ball um, outside the um, uh, front of the hive uh, with, a, with a queen in. Don't poke your finger around because for some reason, these little blighters will sting you. Um, there's, uh, they seem to be a bit more angry than usual. So how are you going to deal with it? Well, you need to understand what's happening, and I've just uh, just given you information. Should be on Cushman's website anyway, and I can promise you there will be um, uh, videos coming up during the summer because we're we're planning those now. Make sure you've got a clear plan. <clears throat> Don't just take half of what one plan say, um, method says, half of something else, half of what the um, somebody's told you at the local association or whatever, have a clear plan exactly what you're going to do. If you need any equipment, that is extra boxes or boards or anything like that, make sure you've got them and you've got them certainly before the season uh, season starts. So that's your plan A. Of course, you need plan uh, B as well because sometimes things can go wrong. Sometimes you need a plan C and occasionally you need plans D to Z because don't forget we, 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 we're dealing with bees and they don't always do what they're supposed to do. What you need to do is you be in control because if you're not in control, the bees are. <clears throat> if the bees are in control, we'll increase the number of beekeepers because somebody will end up with bees in their chimney that are yours and they may not, uh, may not be too pleased about it. But before that, you really can help yourself quite a bit. Have some decent bees. There are some that you can get that, uh, that are um, quite good at swarming. Certainly carniolans will swarm quite a bit. You struggle to keep them in the hive sometimes. So by super in advance, you'll certainly uh, help. And as I've already said, bees can change dramatically, certainly in the spring, uh, with a few good days of, um, uh, of, of fine weather. Um, and they really can poke it in. Just have a look at um, bees coming in uh, in the spring, a great big um, uh, pellets of pollen, and they really flop down onto the um, uh, a lighting board. But you need the knowledge and you also need lateral thinking as well, because sometimes you think, hang on a minute, um, there's something over there that I need to deal with as well. It could be could be something perhaps on the comb or, 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 or whatever. So my method of swarm control, uh, I've used it all my beekeeping life. I have tried others <coughs> and it's an old method. It's very rare, rarely taught these days. Um, and I've called it a Wakeford method simply to give it a name because it didn't have one. And I named it after a man called George Wakeford who uh, taught me in my early days. It's on Cushman's website, uh, a lot clearer than probably me uh, telling you. So I clip a Mark McQueen. So of course I've got uh, 14 day inspections. So if I go to a colony and there's no, um, what I call active queen cells, you can call them charged, you can call them what you like, um, uh, with nothing in, I can leave them 14 days. If you've got unclipped queens, you must go after seven days. If you don't want to swarm, you can go when you like, if you don't mind swarms. If any of those are active, shake the bees off all the combs, cut out all the queen cells with uh, something in. I mean everything, even with eggs. Add a super. Now, I always put my supers on underneath, but I'll, it probably doesn't matter, but... Um, uh, that, that's what I do. <clears throat> I can then return in seven days. 
in about 50% of the cases, I find it's cured it. So you can then go back to 14 day inspections or again seven with unclipped uh, queens. Now, if I've still got active queen cells, forget doing anything else because the bees have made up their mind they're going to swarm uh, and I've now got to take action with me in control, not them. So I remove the queen, cut out all the sealed queen cells, and if, um, if there are any older unsealed ones, um, uh, sorry, yeah, cut out all, all sealed queen cells and the older unsealed ones, because don't forget, queen cells are sealed for about seven days, possibly eight, work on seven, um, what I don't want is a swarm coming out by the next uh, next week. Uh, so the older unsealed uh, are queen cells. <clears throat> I can then return in seven days, perhaps eight. You could just about get away with it. So if you are a weekend beekeeper and um, uh, you've only got Saturdays and Sundays, if last week was a, a Saturday and you, you, you're away, you can't get back in time, uh, you can do it on the Sunday remove all the queen cells just leave one by that time they should all be uh, sealed anyway but there may be emergency cells in fact there's, there's likely to be emergency cells so you just reduce to one um there shouldn't be anything else leave it for two or three weeks and that is basically uh my swarm control method which works an absolute treat why it's not used more i don't know uh you're not getting the increase with it um, you're keeping the whole colony together. You're, you could well be improving your honey production because you've got, um, uh, you've got a brood break uh, and um, it, 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 it's worked for me uh, and I don't need any extra kit. So that's it, folks. Now go and get prepared for the coming season and thanks very much for listening. Uh, th uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, we have a bunch of questions here. Um, first one is, how do you prevent comb honey, honey from granulating? Uh, right, let me try and let's stop sharing. Yeah, okay. Um, well, basically you can't. <clears throat> During the summer, probably it's only oil seed rape is likely to granulate. Um, you you clearly can't um, uh, can't liquefy it uh, again uh, in the comb. Um, I've tried all sorts of things. I tried warming it up in air and covers, but it just doesn't seem to be quite quite enough. What you end up doing is work, m melting the wax. Um, so you, the the idea really is to try and make sure that you don't get. Um, uh, you don't put comb honey on when you've got um, um, uh, nectar's coming in, it's going to granulate. Okay. Uh, next one. Um, I want to move a nuke from a commercial nuke box to national in the spring. What's the best way to go about it? National as commercial to a national. <coughs> you, right. Yeah, you've got, little, yeah, you've got a little bit of a problem that way around. Uh, commercial uh, to a national in the spring, <clears throat> right? Uh, um, commercial nuke to a. I've got to have to think about it. If you've got a, a a brood chamber, then put the nuke in the brood chamber, uh, and then put preferably drawn comb above if you can. Uh, those combs in a in a national box. Um, if you've got a lot of stores on the top of the commercial frames, then put it underneath because the bees will come down into the or should come down into the national uh, national box. Um, if you're doing it the other way, oh hang on, wait just wait. Yeah, if you're doing it the other way. Yeah, yeah, you're better. 
Yeah, I think that's probably about all you, all you can do. I'm wondering why somebody's trying to do it. Um, have they got mixed? Do, do, do you actually know the person, uh, Brendan? Yeah, it's Anne Marie Fogarty. For, uh, um... Right. Have they have they got um, uh, many nationals? They've picked up a a, a commercial new. I, I really don't know. Let's. I think. <laughs> well, we, we there, there, there. I've been. I mean, beans. I'm. I'm not being um, flippant here. Oh no, I know. I do understand. And, uh, 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 another way is to actually sell the. Um, uh sell a commercial nuke uh, okay yeah um because it, it it is actually quite quite difficult if it was a a brood chamber it would be easier the problem is with the nuke um nukes have got flaws you see so you can't put the national nuke on top of the uh commercial nuke yeah let's see I've allowed, I've given uh, Amory um, an ability to speak if she wants to. Amory. Oh, right. Okay. Amory, do, do you want to go off, and off mute? You have to click your mute in the bottom left. Uh, Press your space bar. <laughs> that usually does it. Nah, nah. It's shy, maybe. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll do that, or you can un uh, unmute a bit, Brendan. Uh, I don't know if I can. Um, let's uh, uh, and and Marie, look look on the bottom of your bottom left hand side of your um, screen, where it says mute. You should have a red line going through it. Uh, yeah, she's not going not going to unmute herself. That's okay. Doesn't matter. Let's let's move on. So there's no there's no simple solution to this. It's yeah. no, it's it's it, 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 it's not easy. Um, and it's it's it, it nukes nukes are making it worse because it's not often you get nukes without floors. If you've got a nuke without floor, then you can put that on probably on the top. Right. Yeah, there are some nukes without uh, floors, um, but you know, it all depends on what she has. Okay, let's go on. There's plenty of questions here. How close do you think we are to having sufficiently varroa resistant bees? particularly AM, AMM in UK and Ireland for us not to have to treat? Um, well, if you listen to um, Steve Martin, he re he's reckoning 10 years. Um, he's a scientist. I'm only an ordinary beekeeper. My guess is longer than that. And I'll tell you why, because of all the, all the stuff that Steve, that keeps being imported. We don't know anything about it. It's coming in from outside. It then gets, um, uh, uh, the, the drones mate with what we've got and it's becoming I think quite difficult for those who who are working working their bees without uh, without treatment um, I think we've got to do a lot of thinking about this because um, I think we're going to have quite initially quite a lot of um, losses and what concerns me is there's a lot of new beekeepers um, and a lot of beekeepers are five colonies or less. And of course, if they lose half their bees, I think they're going to get a bit hacked off, and they're going to get um, uh, uh, they're going to start treating. I think it's going to be, and of course we've got, I don't know, we, we've got twenty six thousand members in the BBKA. I think there's about five thousand in the Welsh. You've got about four thousand, four five thousand, don't you? There's about. 4,000 in, in Fibgate, yeah. Yeah, um, well, a lot of them haven't got many uh, many um, yeah. bees, no, unless it was a national um, uh, a national project, you've got all these um, beekeepers in various spots, all trying to do the same thing, and I, 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 th I think we all need help. This is partly what the National Bee Improvement um, uh, a program is is, is trying to um, uh, is trying to achieve. Okay. Not quite answering the question, but I think it's going to be longer than than um, uh, the, 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 than we think. Right. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. <laughs> um, Christina replied, "Yeah, um, thank you for sharing your knowledge, Roger. I want to ask if you have any best practices or ideas about attracting bees to a hive naturally." I prefer not to purchase queens or bees. Well, we all prefer that. 
uh, attract me. What you mean as a as a bite hive? I, I, that's what I assume. Uh, what? Well, yeah, th read it again, Brendan. Okay, so um, if you have any best practices or ideas about attracting <laughs> bees to a hive naturally, so. The, the, uh, they presumably mean a swarming. Yeah. Um, well, I gave the ideas for uh, the bait hive, um, um, but of course you need to be a beekeeper in the first place or get combs from um, a, uh, a known beekeeper. Um, foundation very, very rarely works. It, it really doesn't. And um, I know I've had a bit of ridicule about this, but I'm absolutely convinced that bees go in naturally, nest naturally, where energy lines cross. I've got um, I've got a bit on Dave Cushman's website about about that. Um, I've never seen one, certainly not since 2009. I've never seen um, a swarm come in where there are not, not, no energy lines. Um, but that's, that's that's beyond this talk. Yeah. But ch check on Cushman's website, uh, and I think the page is called something like Bees and Energy Lines. Right. Uh, I think in the UK, ley lines are much better mapped than in Ireland. I don't think <coughs> there is much oh, that, here. Well, actually, uh, two years running at Gormanston, I did a, uh, I did a demonstration, a evening demonstration. And um, uh, I think there were a few scientists there, and I think some of those... Uh, you know, their eyes up as well because um, you know I was I was blinkered, so I couldn't see anything in either side of me. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Okay. Right. Actually, the the other thing, of course, is to use a drop of lemongrass oil. Uh, well, if it, if it, if somebody puts that in and they have it have a swarm come in, um, they they're bound to say it's that. I'm not I'm not convinced about some of these things. The same with um, uh, <coughs> the same with swarm lures too. Mm. Um, I think they will come in anyway. Okay. Um, what extractor do you use for brood box uh, foundation? Well, I've got to be absolutely honest. Um, I haven't extracted my honey now for five or six years. Um, I just haven't got the time. Uh, somebody else does it for me, uh, but. Um, my own extractor is a um, little six frame extractor, uh, tangential, and uh, on each side, uh, each of the three sides, you can either get uh, two shallow frames or one brood frame. <clears throat> but I'm talking about brood frames, I'm not talking about 14 by 12s. Right. Yep. Um, I I believe radio extractors will take them. I believe so. Um, I think it depends on the extractor, probably. Yeah. I, I, I believe, if Jim Ryan's listening, uh, I believe Jim Ryan um, does exactly the same as me. Oh, okay. I don't know, I don't know if, he's out, if he's on the call. <laughs> I don't see his name there anyway. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the uh, the thing is really just to ju 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 just to try them out. Yep. Um, somebody makes a comment. We've got fairy paths here, which I presume is uh, uh, the response to the ley lines. Um, Sorry, what, what did I we've say? We've got fairy paths here. Oh, fairy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, where can I get more info, info on the Patterson unit? Ah, right. Um, there, I believe there's a um, a webinar on um, a Bibber website, um, but I'm going to do that as a um, uh, as a booklet for Bibber. That sh probably should be out by the spring, I would think. But I'm, 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 I'm going to do that, yeah. Oh, there's so many people ask me about it. Okay. Okay. Um, Holding that, uh, when you talk about culling poor bees, what do you do with a bad temper time? Well, what do they mean? Um, <clears throat> uh, 
if you've got a bad tempered hive and it it's got some characteristics that the others haven't got i would tend to hang on to it because if you get a bad tempered hive very often you can get through the temper <clears throat> because i think a lot of a lot of bad temper is caused by what's called f2 aggression so once you can get out of that that second generation um you can generally get get an improvement uh if it um if it hasn't got a uh, a characteristic that um uh the others have got then i would um uh i'm sorry i would just give it the boot treatment the queen that is <clears throat> yep if that's what they wanted to know yep yeah you just get rid of requeens yeah um if yeah uh, if they want to uh chip in they can if they want to know if it's so bad tempered that you can't get into it then i'll i'll can tell them how to get out of that but yeah carry on <clears throat> okay next one recall honey do you recommend eating wax and if it granulates is it is there any way to get back to liquid well we've had that question yeah we've done that. um oh yeah with comb honey <clears throat> and this is one thing with um uh, a lot of beekeepers don't know how to how to eat comb honey. You just eat eat the whole lot. Okay, you might just spit out a little bit of wax, but <laughs> the plant stealers won't mind. Um, I see. And, and uh, a third part of that question was: What are the advantages disadvantages of using comb honey with kebab sticks for support? Ah. Uh... I think I think somebody might be misinterpreting what I said. Um, people very often use kebab sticks uh, when they're using foundationless um, uh, combs, and they put the kebab sticks in between the um, uh, the top wedge and the bottom bar. Uh, so when the bees build down effectively it's it's reinforced lot wiring <clears throat> they may they may have misunderstood what i said i, I, I don't know okay. um uh, let's see um any tips and story on used frames which were made up with foundation but not used that are made up of made what? up with foundation but not used um <sighs> You've certainly got to keep them upright. Um, I would keep them in a fairly cool place, if if at all possible. It sounds as if somebody probably made them up one year and they haven't used them. Um, right. Um, yeah, and then when you come to the spring, um, you what you need to do is fresh them up a bit. It's not quite answering the question, but um, uh, certainly keep them upright. Make sure that excuse me <coughs> make sure the mice can't get in there come the spring they'll be a little bit tired a little bit stale if you've got a greenhouse or a, a conservatory on a warm day uh just face them a little bit towards the sun for only well a minute or two a couple of minutes something like that um so they 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 become a bit more pliable and they um uh if they've got a, a sort of white bloom that they've picked up during the winter, that that disappears, and um, uh, the, the, it, it it regains the aroma. If you can then usually get away with it, do it both sides, of course. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, let's see. Next one. Um, Sorry, going back to the last one. You shouldn't be. Uh, uh, you shouldn't get it so warm that it sags yep. um okay next question what do you do with supers that have a percentage of bee bread stored <clears throat> well you've got to wait to the spring um and sometimes it stay as it is then uh, you could put it back on bees if it goes moldy just um take a high tool and scrape it back down very gently to the midrib sometimes it goes really hard rock hard scrape it down to the midrib and you can usually get away with it 
Oh. Should we reuse super frames that appear reasonable or change them regardless? I've got some that's probably 40 years old. <laughs> um, but yeah. having said that, I do know some people that uh, change their super combs as often as they change the um, uh, uh, brood combs. There's absolutely no need to. No need to at, at all. Um, uh, on healthy bead check comb pick, there's a gap at the bottom between comb and bottom bars. Is there a particular reason for that? Yep. <clears throat> It's to do with the depth of the floor. If you've got what's called a, a deep floor, um, what happens is that the um, uh, the bees will build in that gap underneath the um, uh, the uh, uh, a frame. If you've got a shallow floor, they can't do that. So they generally leave a gap above the. Um, uh, the um, uh, the bottom bars, mm -hmm. so it's really the depth of the floor that um, it does that, and that's one of the problems that I find with uh, poly nukes. The gap underneath the uh, frame is far too deep, <clears throat> uh, so that's why you get that great big lump of um, a comb underneath, which can um, there better be a warning here. Uh, can um, uh, the bees can put queen cells in there and they can hide them. Um, next one, uh, you mentioned clipping and marking a swarm queen if possible. What about a virgin queen in a cast swarm? <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> well, no, you, if they look decent bees, I clearly wouldn't do it. Um, but um, uh, if, the, uh, if they didn't look particularly good bees, then I, would, um, uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't hesitate in clipping them. But on the other hand, very often with casts, there's more than one virgin queen. I helped somebody take 19 virgin queens uh, out of one on one occasion, and they still took off, so there were more. Okay. Um, in the Wakefield, Wakeford method, do you cull the queen, or can you use her to form a new... If it's a <clears throat> good queen... Never get rid of a good queen. Um, you can you can u generally use her uh, uh, somewhere. If she isn't a good queen, yes, I, I would call her. Uh, but then the question is going to be, but hang on, the uh, the queen cells you left behind um, uh, are going to be her daughters. Uh, so the ones you've left behind, if you've got another one that's putting up. Uh, queen cells and they're better than that then just um uh, uh just substitute okay um, so they seem there's another question almost the same or apathy is worth it for rearing queens ah. um well you don't rear queens in apathy you, you 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 might them um I've got some fairly strong views on apodeas, I'm afraid. Um, they do need um, uh, they do need a lot of experience. Um, I see people coming out of places like the BBK convention with one under their arm, and you know they're beginner beekeepers, and they're told that oh, all you need is a couple of bees and a uh, a queen cell. Hey, presto, you've got some. Um, uh, you, you've got you've got a new queen it, it's very rarely like that um, there's lots of things that can happen if you do want to go down the apodeo route i suggest that you um uh, contact somebody who's good at using them um they're, they're perfectly okay but they need managing and in in, in in different ways there are quite a lot of things that can, can, can go wrong um that aren't always spotted in in in, in the books Okay. Um, well, next one. With your swarm control method, can you increase colony numbers if desired? Yep. <clears throat> yeah, you can take a, a nucleus away um, uh, quite easily. So perhaps um, uh, instead of, if we we're at the point where you take the queen away, if you took her away and a a, a comb or a couple of combs, and that would be ideal for making up what I call two-frame nuke. 
Um, and that again is another going to be another uh, booklet, but that is on Cushman's website, and it's also on the Bibble website as a uh, as a webinar. Make up a two frame nuke, and all you need is one frame of food, which needn't come from the um, uh, the swarming colony. Could come from somewhere else. So a frame of food uh, and a frame of larger sealed brood, and if you want to uh, put the old queen in that. Uh, you could do. So, of course, the, um, uh, what's happening in the main colony, uh, you're leaving the young queen to take over. <clears throat> okay. um, what's the difference between calmness and temper in your definition? Calmness and temper. Um, well, cal uh, oh, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Um, on, the, uh, on the record sheet, calmness is calmness on the comb. <clears throat> Temper is their um, gentleness, docility, call it what you like, uh, their yep. uh, defensiveness. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I didn't, do, didn't explain that one. Perhaps I should in future. Yeah. Um, let's see, next one is a common <clears throat> Um How do you lay your brood frames out, warm or cold? I much prefer the uh, the cold way, the so-called cold way. It actually doesn't make any difference. Interestingly, I'm the apiary manager at my local association, was for Green, and um, we've usually got at least 20 colonies there, honey production. Um, I run them all the cold way, apart from two that I run the warm way. And it's surprising when you do things like that, that how things um, uh, how things come out. Firstly, the um, uh, the members don't seem to like it um, because with uh, with the cold way you can work from both sides of the brood chamber if you want to. So if you get somebody who's perhaps a little bit short, instead of reaching right over, if they want to go right to the brood nest, they um, uh, they can go around the other side. But interestingly. <clears throat> I've noticed that those colonies don't build up um, quite so fast. And I think one of the reasons is that when the queen is, um, is, is expanding the brood nest, uh, she comes up against a, uh, a wall, which is effectively the, the, the midrib. Um, and um, it's got to expand quite a bit for her to go the other side of that comb. So what you very often get, certainly early in the season, is you get one frame with uh, with just brood on one side. If you've got them going the other way, they can expand back on six, eight, ten frames. Okay. Um, and certainly we we find that okay, it's only two colonies. Certainly we find the um, uh, the uh, honey yield is quite a bit down on on the rest of the colonies. Okay. Um, it, it would be interesting for somebody to do a, a ser fairly serious experiment on that, yeah. because of course it's only anecdotal. Yeah. Um, what's your view on fourteen by twelve boxes? Um, <clears throat> personally, I don't like them. Um, I uh, I did have one uh, a long time ago. They're actually a very old idea. It's just that they've come in the last. 15 or 20 years. Um, they're too big for the, the sort of bees I keep. Um, if I wanted a bigger box, um, I think the commercial would be a, a better box than the 14 by 12. Um, now I have seen <clears throat> in demonstrations, I have seen frames fall out uh, of those. I don't know if I can do anything here, here or not with a, with a sheet of paper. Um, let's say this is the top bar of the frame. Um, no, I haven't got a frame there. And somebody tipped it up and, and the, the frame, the comb has actually fallen out of the frame. Uh, and I've probably seen that on three or four occasions. Um, I use my combs for everything, as you, as you know, um, my brood combs for everything. Uh, and certainly I wouldn't want to extract a 14 by 12. <laughs> or need not to uncap it. Um, 
I unless you've got prolific bees, I can't see any any need for them. Um, I'm planning on trying my hand next season with the section rack from thorns. Do you have any advice, for example, getting them started to build comb? Uh, <coughs> well, the old beekeepers. I mean, you you you've got some good section producers. Um, uh, in, in Ireland. Um, the old beekeepers in England, what they used to do was they used to um, uh, get a swarm. Um, uh, if they got a big swarm, they would get a full super, put a section rack above that and put the swarm in the super. So that what they did was they, 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 they forced them to empty the super out and put all the, um, uh, put all the, um, uh, the honey in the in the sections. Um, I've very rarely used them. Um, they work in good years. Um, what I think you need to do is to uh, make sure that everything is warm, because some of our uh, so nights can actually be quite chilly, and I think that's a that's a a a, a, a problem with them. Um, no, I haven't really used enough um, Donegal bees. Um, he's a he's a section uh, yep. a producer. I would, I would I think he's probably much more clued up than I am. I think he uses CDB hives, which are you know double walled hives. Yes, he does. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> well, of course, that's what the real old um, uh, the good section producers used to use uh, a double walled hive. And, that, and, and they did actually pack them. Um, you're almost finished. Any tips for making syrup and stopping it from going moldy? <coughs> now, this is what I do. <laughs> um, I use the old two pound to a pint, which works out of four kilos of sugar, two and a half kilos of water, absolutely spot on. So what I do is I have got uh, two plastic buckets on, that I put on my kitchen floor. Uh, I put the water in first. So I put five uh, litres of water in each one uh, first. I've got a mark on the buckets. I then put sugar in, bit at a time, and stir it as I go. Um, that's with cold water, and I can usually do about four buckets in a day, something like that. Every time I go past, I just give it a stir. Um, so that's making up syrup nice and easy. If you've got hot water, it will obviously uh, be, uh, be quicker than that. I put thymol in mine and get on Cushman's website. And um, you, I use a thymol at about two or three times what's called manly strength and it stops it going moldy and the great thing about it is if you don't use it all this um this autumn you can put it in a container and it'll be absolutely fine in the spring so it doesn't go moldy it doesn't ferment either exactly what i do too <laughs> okay well why didn't you answer the question then brenda uh, no <laughs> You're the expert, not me. No, 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 no. I'm, what do you, I'm, I'm, what do you think? No, I got, I, I got the measurements from from the the, the Dave Cushman site. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. What, you, what 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 you need is a little bit of alcohol, but that's that's no uh, uh, that, that's no problem, um, and that is to dissolve the thymol uh, crystals. Yeah. Um, but I've I've been doing that now for ten or fifteen years, and I haven't had anywhere near the problems I used to have. Of course, I used to be mean and um, I thought, oh, well, you know, I, I, I won't, won't spend the money. Um, and uh, uh, I now wish I'd done it 30 years earlier. Yep. Um, and the final question, what do you think of the house hives? I'm not sure what they are. How do you spell it? It's spelled B-A-H-O-U-S. I wonder are they those plastic Sort of funny ones, funny shaped ones. Uh, B I H O U S. Ah, B House. Oh, they're probably B E H O. Yeah, yeah, probably. Are. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
I don't know if they're still making them or not. I certainly, oh, when they first came out 10 or 15 years ago, um, there was a quite a, um, uh, a quite a flurry of activity. Uh, now, um, I've, I haven't used them, but I've handled these in them on many occasions. What they are is a plastic version of the Darsington hive. Now, I found, uh, I better be careful here because I don't want to end, end up in court repeating myself. Um, but the, the legs are sort of angled out. And what I found is on a couple of occasions, um, uh, people tripped over those. Uh, so I think you've got to watch out where, you, where, where your feet are. What I found is the, and they, um, they, uh, they showed one at the National Honey Show several years ago. And what I found was there were lots of gaps in there. And I thought to myself, mm, if ever we get small hive beetle, it's going to be the ideal place for small hive beetle to, um, uh, 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 to rest up. Um, there's a great big, um, uh, lid um, that, that's quite light and that will very definitely need weigh, weighing down um, I I um, I haven't got a closed mind to new things I, I I certainly have a look at them but I don't think that's something that I'd be using but if you want to keep bees in a milk bottle keep bees in a milk bottle if it works it works for you um, then uh, then absolutely fine. <clears throat> uh, and, and not unrelated one, here's a, a couple more questions just came in. Uh, is it worth invest investigating in a flow hive? Is there, sorry? Is it worth investing in a flow hive? Um, <clears throat> if, you want to, if you want to buy a beehive, providing you, um, you understand your bees and you, you really care for them, <clears throat> I really don't mind what which kind of hive you um uh, you, uh, you have. Um, if you enjoy working with a flow hive um, and you spent your money, uh, then you'll think it's worth in investing. Um, one thing which I think is sad is that people who've never used them um, have have made up their minds that they don't like them, which I think is a uh, is a bit unreasonable. It's not my style at all. Um, so if you want to, I I wouldn't, um, because I I don't think they're going to work with me because we've got granulated um, honey certainly earlier uh, early in the season. <clears throat> um, just uh, there are three questions, but they they're all along the same vein, so I let them all, ask them all together. So any thoughts? So there's the rose hive. The long hive and the top bar hive. What are your views on these? Um, the rose hive um, was uh, designed by Tim Rowe. Um, I have to say, I've never used one. Um, they're the boxes, they're one size box, which are about halfway between a national, um, yeah, they're national, halfway between the, the brood frame and the, um, and the super frame which actually I think is a, is a good idea. Um, Tim has got a different construction method than the standard construction method, uh, which, um, uh, which, which seems to work. I think one of the best things about the Rose Hive is his book. Um, that's brilliant. There are lots of tips and tricks in there. And I would recommend buying that just for just just for just for those um <clears throat> i think probably for new beekeepers um it um uh, it, it would be a good thing but because everyone's entrenched in in the standard ones uh, i think it probably hasn't taken off like it like, like it should have done but Tim really came up with the idea, the same as a, a, a lot of people have, including me. Why not I'll just have a one size box? And we, of course, we never got around to it. Tim did. And um, uh, I doubt if he's uh, made a fortune out of it, but it, it's certainly a different aspect. I would, um, uh, I would certainly recommend that people went, went that way if they wanted to. 
Uh, Longhive. <clears throat> um, I I had a Longhive on one, one occasion, and I found that with other hives that it was such such a nuisance. Uh, simply because it was a different type in exactly the same as, as having perhaps a, a Langstroth and a, uh, and a WBC. It, it, it's just not, um, uh, not, not really suitable. Now, bees tend to go upwards. Cavities in trees, which is a natural home, go upwards. They don't go lengthways. <clears throat> the, uh, but having said that, um, uh, bees will actually live quite well between the the, um, uh, the 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 floor and the ceiling of a house. I've seen it on many occasions, and they go right along. Um, uh, okay, they've got the warmth of the house. Um, what worries me, perhaps, is the winter when the, when, when the bees can't can't move sideways. Um, but if 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 a long hive works um, and you like it, use it. What you will find probably is a different management system, but that's okay. And the uh, the top bar hive, I think that's similar, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, top bar hive is a slightly different um, uh, thing because you haven't got the comb held in by the frame all the way around, so you need to. Um, you need to. Um, move the frame that way rather than hold it up like that like a lot of us people do that's okay providing you 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 remember that um now i've come across several people have used them and if you make them all the same size um, that's fine but sometimes people make them different size so you can't interchange combs um you know it's, it's only a, a small thing i know but um uh, but it's something you need to be aware of. Um, if you if you like top bar hives, like have top bar hives. Okay. Well, I think that's the end of the questions. There have been a lot of comments thanking you, saying it was very interesting. And, okay, uh, Brendan. And I have to thank you as well. Thank you very much. It was very informative and very interesting. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Okay. Ma hopefully at um, Gormanston. Oh, yeah. Well, it doesn't look like it's going to happen this year but, or in 2021 either, but maybe maybe next year or no. year after. <laughs> OK, well, thanks so much, Brendan. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.